Yeah. 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 Yeah.
a portion of this through attendance. Um, Pre-pandemic, we had a 96% attendance rate. Today, we're sitting a little less than 93. And so that's about a $3 million loss of ongoing revenue that we are actualizing that loss um, in, this, uh, in this current year and into the future. So really working to encourage our, our students to attend when they're well and uh, take advantage of short-term independent study uh, if possible. So, uh, you know, all districts are gonna face this same challenge to some degree, uh, but coupling our challenge with declining enrollment and attendance is we're gonna feel that effect a little more intensely than some. That's all for me. Thank you, Matt. Any questions for Matt? Mm -hmm. uh, just a quick question. So what, maybe you said this, sorry, the, the 3% decline 96 to 93, what, do you, what is that being attributed to? So I mean, is that just, is that the declining enrollment piece or is no, that just the students that are enrolled that aren't, what do you correct? Yeah, so I think that, um, I think many parents are keeping kids home longer when they're showing signs of illness. Um, I think during the pandemic, we had online learning options that are still exist to, to much to the to a pretty high degree. So, like a student uh, pre-pandemic attending a class at a particular school, you know, if they miss school, there's a there's a uh, it's difficult for them to figure out what those assignments were, track their progress, connect with their teacher, and some of those barriers have been reduced post-pandemic. So a student can track along in Canvas what's happening in class, they can be on vacation, have a little more agency and control over what's happening. So I think that's part of it. And I think, uh, I know that's true for my own family, that like, kid has a sniffle now, we're like, COVID test, maybe you should stay home today. Pre-pandemic, we're like, yeah, kid out of here, we're going to school. <laughs> so I think that shift in culture is part of it. And then we are seeing more chronic absenteeism amongst a certain population of students. So I think that is, um, you know, those two things together uh, are contributing to this decline. Yeah. And it's happening across the state. Yeah, thank you. All right, uh, with that, we will move to agenda item number five. We'll go to the discussion items, and we have the city DJUSD collaboration on traffic improvements. Since the city is listed first, I will turn to, um, to Kelly. I think this was an item that was put on by the district, and I believe there was maybe a particular conversation you wanted to have with it, so I'm going to turn to Matt. <laughs> yeah, so I think one of the things that we are, uh, there's, there's sort of two things going. I think we've got the Anderson Corridor project that continues to sort of plug along um, as a result of that SACOG grant, but I think that this is mostly a conversation about uh, Hamill Street uh, in front of Pioneer. Um, so there's a lot of tra school traffic around uh, pickup drop-off times at Pioneer. Um, it's one of our smallest pickup drop-off lanes that is not well designed. It looks like a triangle as opposed to a sort of uh, pull, pull through lane. So we've been uh, talking with the city staff about uh, ways to approach this challenge. Um, and one of the ideas that we came up with together was essentially to uh, potentially change channel into a one-way street so that drop-off was moving, what is it? Uh, westbound. westbound well, yeah, the street would be going westbound. Yes, and that would allow for a drop-off without kids crossing the street or potentially crossing the, um, the, the, the drop, the parking lot, which has drop-off as well. And um, so I think there's a survey that's gone out. Maybe you can talk a little about that. So staff uh, in our public works department did send out a survey to the neighbors. I believe the letter went out just last week. And so it's looking for input from the neighbors and the residents on Hamel to say, you know, is this something that you would be interested in? Um, you know, what are your thoughts? What are your ideas? We will have that letter out. We'll be taking input for that for the next couple of weeks and then um, kind of round that piece up and come back and work with the district again on you know, what our options are. Um, we want to know what the residents are thinking um, before we get you know, too far uh, into any kind of conceptual ideas. So um, that's where that piece is. Um, and I think that you know, we have had some good conversations with staff from the city side, both talking about the, um, the actual you know, the, the the education of students and parents uh, and neighbors in terms of how pickup, drop off, and traffic should happen, um, 
along with the enforcement issues. I think police department has been involved in the conversations um, and then uh, uh, conversations with the district, the district staff in, in terms of their needs. So we're really just trying to jointly work to figure out what would be the best solution for all the parties involved. One of the challenges that we have in, with any school site really is that you have an, you know, a tremendous influx of, of traffic of people on um, all different, you know, whether they're biking, walking, coming in cars um, for 20 minutes and then, you know, relative quiet for most of the rest of the day. So you've got you know, two very busy time periods and then nothing. So we want to be careful um, or at least thoughtful about how we make any changes or how we might engineer something uh, and make sure that it really works for um, you know, the, the entirety of the, um, the time and the, the types of traffic that are there. Thank you. Questions for Kelly or Matt? Yeah, so a quick one for you, Kelly. So um, I appreciate that update because I didn't realize that all of all that was going on around that, and I do get emails about that. And so, in terms of where I route with that person, because I knew, so is there a particular entity in the city they should contact? Yes. Yeah, so it's our Public Works Engineering and Transportation Department. Um, Ryan Chapman is uh, a good point person to to direct them to. Okay. Thank and you. on our side, uh, Director of Student Support Services, Kara Messmore. Oh, okay. That's good to know. Because I sent them to you. Yeah, so, that's totally fine. <laughs> that's good to know. Thank you. So, yeah, question. Thank you. So, um, if I understand correctly, you're, you um, give a survey or surveying the, the neighborhood. And after surveying the neighborhood, are you then going to survey, um, uh, let's say, uh, other families as well? Uh, other, you know, PTA or whatever? Because I can. I, one of my kids goes to school there, and I can see parents saying, wait a minute, why weren't we asked about this, uh, you know, because we drop our kids off. So I was just, I know the first priority, of course, is those that live in that area, because it's going to impact them the most. Yeah, and I think depending on how that survey comes out, we'll talk about how best to discuss this with our school community. Mm -hmm. Uh, because as we know, when there's any improvements on campus, there's always mixed feelings uh, about that. And so, you know, we want to be thoughtful and deliberate about that. We do have other options, other treatments that we could put into place. We don't think any of those would be as effective to keep students safe as, as this. This is why we're pursuing this first and foremost. But if this doesn't materialize, we, we need to do something. Yeah. Uh, I, don't think it, I don't think it's tenable for it to stay the way it is long haul. Yeah. No, I'm glad it's being looked at because I deal with that challenge every day. <laughs> yeah, and this, quite frankly, is the challenge of uh, more drivers. Uh, you know, on our schools, for schools that weren't designed for more drivers. So I think that's something we're going to need to continue to grapple with. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, just two quick questions. One is, I assume that the the um, westbound, the idea of running it westbound is to have the traffic flowing, once they drop off, the traffic flowing is, it's not backed up down Campbell. If it runs eastbound, Presumably, you'd have traffic completely backed up, waiting to get in, and then homeowners or people going to work would get stuck in that one lane or the, you know heading eastbound. Is that the idea of the east versus west, or what's the idea behind it? I should say. I think, I think the main idea was that the school side would essentially be the drop-off lane, and then the southern lane. No. Yeah, the southern lane would be the sort of pull-out lane. So as you oh, drop sure. off your student, you know, right yeah. up to the school sidewalk, yeah. then you pull out into the pull-out lane. Um, it's like our school, it's like uh, Montgomery and Emerson have two have two lane drop-offs. Yeah. One is where okay. traffic is stopping and dropping, and the yeah. other is pull-out move. Yeah. So the neighbors, you know, are almost all on that sure. southern on side. side. Yeah. It's just I think maybe one or two driveways on the north side on the far west of Hamel. And it was trying trying to minimize the um, the crossing of street for the yeah. students so right. dropping off right on the school side. Yeah, and I think one of the pieces, and I and obviously this will all play out, and I the other part of that that I hope is that, that what we do there is, is some sort of pilot programming like we did at was it fourteenth and oak yeah. when we put in that and got feedback from the community. So I think one of the downsides to running it that way, right, is the backflow of traffic out on the on the Schmeiser into onto Cobell, which we've dealt with um, 
I met with Bryson himself there, and then we had Darren came out with his team. We added an extra crossing guard there because of the, the intensity of cars getting upset, right, and peeling off and taking off, and they couldn't get in and out. Obviously, this would address some of those issues with a one way, but I'm just, I, I would love, and hopefully, we're able to do something like that where we do some temporary pilots and run them eastbound, westbound one way. Um, I don't know your timeline, Matt. I would assume that you want this done right before next school year. Possibly, I don't know if that pilot would need to happen before the end of the school year or if they're thinking about that. I think my interest is to have it done right. Um, yeah, to have the best sure. possible solution. And, and you know, piloting is one way that you can make sure that it's done as effectively as possible. Uh, but I, I don't know that we have a firm timeline. Yeah. Like, want to have it done by this date. Sure. And whatever we do is going to require some education and some changing of habits for right. all the folks involved, whether they're whether it's this current year or whether it's beginning of next year. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think we've learned lessons from changing different roadways and not piloting and then having to redo things. So I, I would encourage us to, obviously, we want it done right. If it takes a little bit longer to get it done right, that's great. And I would offer, um, obviously, this is Cecilia's, Cecilia's district and mine as well, um, any help that I can have with community meetings or, you know, outreach. To, I have a lot of, know a lot of friends that live on Schmeiser and on Hamel, um, as I imagine Cecilia does as well. So however I can assist and facilitate things through the city side, I'm happy to be engaged in that conversation. Yeah, great. I think, uh, you know, as those surveys go out, just engaging in that conversation and the tension that Kelly outlined that we're really busy for 30 or 40 minutes a day and then the rest of the day is uh, a lot less busy on animals. So just, yeah. you know, finding a good way to manage that balance, to find that the balance. Yeah. And I think the other thing is just remembering that it's usually, you know, three parts. There's the engineering portion, there's the enforcement portion, and then there's the education portion. And so probably no solution is going to be just one of those. It's probably going to be a mix of all three. Yeah, thank you. I don't envy that, that your position. <laughs> I, I drove by Montgomery this morning when it was raining, and, and that's a huge drop-off area. Yeah. And it was backed up out on the street. And same thing with Harper. When it rains, you can't even get in there, and things are bad. So and when you go by Pioneer, you can see why that challenge is what it is. That is a tiny parking lot. So um, I just wanted to thank Kelly and the city staff. You know, the, this is the kind of collaboration and cooperation that we've been engaging in far more regularly in the last five or so years. And really, we come up with better solutions when we do it together. And, well, you know, walking hand in hand as, as far down the road as we can. So really, really appreciate that. All right, thank you. Any other questions for my colleagues? All right, seeing none, just for in case somebody is here for public comment, we'll, um, we'll go through each of these uh, items and, and discussion items under uh, agenda item five and then take public comment. So we will do it for each of the items, uh, just just so you know. Um, we'll get to public comment at the end of that. Um, I'll welcome uh, Trustee Jackson to our meeting. Welcome, nice to see you again. Um, and we will move to discussion uh, item five B, um, City DJ USC collaboration on workforce ha workforce housing. Yeah, I think uh, we've got a current collaboration going around demographics, and I haven't got any updates on that end. Um, uh, but we are certainly uh, pursuing uh, workforce housing projects. We're actually, as a district, creating some uh, cooperative uh, sort of learning groups uh, regionally with districts. Um, and we may actually have some other public agencies interested who are looking to develop workforce housing. This is not our core business as a school district and even as a city. You know, we're, uh, those are things that are sort of emerging in terms of uh, housing development for our staff. Uh, so looking to do some some learning regionally about how to do that and how to do that well. Um, but we're certainly uh, targeting uh, the land behind Harper to develop in the not so distant future and have some significant component of that uh, dedicated to solve uh, some portion of workforce housing. Uh, we intend to do a survey sometime here in the coming months um, and have been uh, uh, connected to the UC uh, City Lab which is essentially a research entity. We are working with California School Boards Association to help us develop that survey for our employees to try to figure out what problem we're trying to solve or problems we're trying to solve um, and to create a solution that's gonna be most effective for our folks looking to have housing in Davis. So. Um, we've been working together, both city and um, the district, uh, <coughs> in terms of trying to share some of the data that we have. Um, to be able to come up with a, a study or uh, information that you know, will help us understand um, 
where the, you know, the students and what kinds of developments have what uh, numbers and demographics of students. Um, so hopefully that information will be useful. I don't know what the uh, conclusion date for finishing that up is, but I think they've been working on it um, pretty heartily. Uh, and hopefully that information will be helpful both to the, the board and also to the city council as we you know, move forward with many different projects over the next year or so. Thank you. Oh, the microphone. Thank you. I'll bring it back to the dais and my colleagues. Don? Yeah, um, thank you, Matt, for that. So can you talk a little bit more about these learning groups? Like who's in a group? How do they come together? Yeah. What's the outreach to form them? Yeah, so we've, I, we've been reaching out to districts who either we read about in the paper or connect through our own peer networks that are either exploring or doing workforce housing projects. And uh, the thing that we're finding is that everyone is sort of recreating the wheel to some degree um, as they go through their own internal process. Um, and so we're looking to sort of come together periodically, maybe facilitated by an uh, expert in the field that can help us understand like what problems, you, you know, how do you identify the problem? What are, your, uh, what are your assets? What sort of financing capability do you have? Um, how do you work with city partners? You know, all those things are relatively new to school districts and uh, you know try to learn from one another regionally to advance the work. So it's basically other school districts kind yeah. of work yeah. navigating it. So it's not as though there are these focus groups here in this region no. of community okay. Yeah. One thing I was curious about uh, that came up quite a while ago and there was some discussion at the school board about it where a meeting where uh, some district, one or more districts, maybe in the Bay Area, they're going to use Prop 39 bond funds to build workforce housing. Yeah. Which I know had a lot of people going, oh, didn't know you could do that. Can you yeah. do that? Yes. Is, is that happening? Yeah, San Diego has a project going. Um, Jefferson Union High School District in San Mateo used CFD funds uh, to finance a 110 unit uh, project in San Mateo um, and that there are some districts who either have recently passed or are intending to run a bond project you know a facilities bond that includes workforce housing development so yeah we've got two we have two DJ USD CFDs two different ones that's right interesting okay yes. yeah. thank you Don Hi, Ms. Cecilia Hi. I just want to say uh, this project really excites me because uh, we've heard time and time again, you know, from uh, teachers how they really would love to be able to afford to live in Davis, and um, it's a shame to lose such good teachers, you know, because they, they can't live here and they can't continue to drive an hour or so away back and forth. So I'm just really excited about the, the possibility uh, of this happening and um, collaborating with the city. Thank you. Thank you. Arm. Sure, and, uh, and of course this does relate somewhat. We do have a number of students who attend Davis schools from out of district and often they're uh, uh, the children of employees in, in the district and um, even that's a stretch of course. Um, it's attractive that they can enroll their kids and so that's that's the motivation there. If they don't have kids in the district then, um, then that uh, incentive necessarily to do work in the district is, is missing. So the workforce housing um, helps to add to that in, in my view. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for, for doing this. I think overall, from the kind of a holistic viewpoint, it's um, encouraging to see this continued reflection on assets that the school district has. I mean, it's in looking at the housing crisis, right? I mean, specifically what we're talking about here is the workforce related to teachers, but it directly relates to so much of the work that we are doing at the city, trying to meet our numbers and provide more housing. And that would obviously open up space for teachers as well. But I um, appreciate the target approach that you're looking at here and, and taking on a tough challenge, right? That's not gonna be easy. Um, and I think that you have um, partners um, in our community who, who, who truly recognize the highest housing crisis that we're in here. And I think there's been a, a movement towards um, wanting to see some of this growth happen, especially on that site where you're inside city limits and you're in the curve, right? You own the property and there's some of the barriers aren't there. So 
um, and would be B Street site too, right? And really stepping back and identifying those to where um, we can make the school district stronger and more solvent. And as we all know, you know, a successful, healthy school district is, is a huge benefit to the city. And they go hand in hand, right? People that move here because they want, they want great teachers, they want great schools, they want a safe place to go to school. That all relates to people moving to our city and the work that we do. So um, I truly appreciate um, the, the trustees and, and uh, Superintendent Best and your team um, tackling these issues that aren't going to be easy uh, as they move forward. Uh, but I think you have strong partners, um, not from a staff side, but I think sitting up here to, to try and move these forward. So thank you for the continued work on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, with that, we'll move to discussion item 5C, facility and capital improvement project updates. Uh, looks like the district is slated to go first. Yeah, so we have a number of projects happening um, currently. You've, if you've been down 14th Street, you've uh, seen the STEM building is definitely taking shape. Um, we wrapped it for the winter uh, so that we could continue work because we are very tight on the timeline to make sure the building is done this summer so that it can be, we, uh, we are, in, we're going to remove 10 classrooms of the portable classrooms. They're sort of on the north side of Davis High School. And so, of course, you need, if you're going to take those out, you've got to have the rooms 100% ready uh, to move the things into and make sure we can start school. So uh, with the building wrapped, you can definitely see what the shape of that building is going to look like. Um, it includes 12 classrooms. Almost all of them are uh, specialized. Uh, almost most of them are for science. Um, uh, our primary science classrooms at Davis Senior High School are original to the campus's construction. They were updated about 25 years ago, a little more than almost 30 years ago, and are definitely in need of, uh, of, of modernization. So STEM building will be a great addition. Um, we have uh, four transitional kindergarten, kindergarten classroom uh, projects going at four of our elementaries. Uh, these will allow for a universal transitional kindergarten, which is a new program at the state over the last several years, which essentially adds a 14th grade uh, called Transitional Kindergarten that uh, at its full build out in the 25-26 school year where it will offer uh, uh, free public education to all four-year-olds. And um, in order to do that and move to an extended kinder day kindergarten program, so it goes for like the same duration as a, as a primary or intermediate grade, um, we need more classrooms. Uh, so we are using the remainder of our bond funds, some of those CFD funds I mentioned earlier, to do this construction. Uh, our first four sites are Korematsu, Montgomery, Putlin, and oh, now it's really testing my memory. <laughs> Pioneer. That's the other one. So those will be our first four. And those four were chosen because they're uh, sort of ease of placement location. The remaining four, Birch Lane, Chavez, uh, North Davis, and sure. Willet are a little more complex in terms of where those buildings would go. Mm -hmm. um, and so we intend for those projects to start construction the first four this summer, this coming summer, and they would be ready for the 25 26 school year. The next phase would be essentially following a year behind. I'm um, also starting uh, this summer, as soon as those portables come out of the north side of Davis High School, we will start construction on a, an aquatic center. Um, which is sort of nestled uh, in between the uh, North Gym and the South Gym, um, sort of where those portable classrooms are, just south of the baseball field. And uh, that will be uh, that project will take a little about 14 months. Uh, so we'll open likely winter of 25, uh, first of the year in 26, somewhere right around there. Uh, and those are really our main projects that are um, in the pipe here that have. Uh, funding allocated, um, and most of them have uh, project designs uh, well underway. We also have uh, strategic fencing projects uh, coming down the road. We did our initial community outreach at three sites, Willett, North Davis, and Davis Senior High School. And the purpose of our strategic fencing uh, projects are to limit access to and from campus. Uh, and as we have uh, fewer entry and exit points off campus that allows for more adequate supervision and quite frankly cross traffic from the public um, uh, during the school day. Uh, at Willett there's an off-reach off dog park uh, right next door and there's really no barriers uh, for folks transiting
visiting uh, north, south, across the park. Um, and the same is true at North Davis. We have folks traveling from F Street to the library or all the way across over to Oak Street, um, walking through our campuses during the school day. Um, and um, so those are some of the problems we're trying to solve with uh, these strategic fencing projects. And that's really it for our construction projects. We're, we're sort of on the back half of the Measure M uh, bond projects and the additional, we had about $80 million of other funds uh, in addition to the $150 million Measure M funds. So we're, we're really with these last few projects here uh, between now and 2026, uh, nearing the end of the, uh, of a, what will be a $235 million construction window. Thank you, Matt. Kelly? We don't have as many buildings, but we do a lot of roads. Um, so I think uh, there's there's a couple projects to mention specifically. Uh, I think Anderson and Chavez was mentioned a little bit earlier. We have just um, I believe, signed the um, cooperative agreement between the district and the city to get the design work started for that. So that should be underway. Um, and that project is, you know, we've been talking about that for a long time, so that'll be, that'll be good to get that into the next steps. Um, with the Villanova and 14th uh, area project, we are working on design right now. It is our intent, as it is with all of our projects that are adjacent to or right affecting schools, to try to do that in the summer. Um, however, with that one, we are working with our, or waiting on some information back from some of the granting agency uh, pieces to know where, when we can start and when that will have to be done. Um, so we'll be in close communication with Matt and his staff um, to try to figure out if that's not able to be completed during the summer, um, you know, what the best uh, what the best alternatives are and, and how we you know, kind of manage that. Uh, so we'll be working through that. Um, H Street, uh, which is over by the Little League Fields, and which is a kind of a cut through for folks, for kids coming back and forth to homes and to the high school. Um, that we are also hoping to get underway uh, later this summer. And then, um, as I noted at the beginning, um, we have our annual paving uh, package or paving program that this past year uh, did involve quite a number of arterial streets that were adjacent to or in the vicinity of kind of the safe routes to school. Um, by campuses. We're putting together our package for the coming year um, and it will likely be much, a much smaller package because we front-loaded a lot of the work this past year. So hopefully, um, at least as far as the school district is concerned, um, far fewer effects to uh, the kids going back and forth to school. But that will um, we'll be finalizing that and then as we get closer to that, we'll also communicate with the district of what we're looking at. I think those are the major um, projects. There's a couple of projects I don't have to mention anymore because they're done. <laughs> I'm happy for that. So that's it. I'm happy for that as well. <laughs> um, her? Sure. Um, just uh, as uh, for, for context and curiosity, how often, um, I, I know this, this might be a kind of a depends question, but how often do uh, roads get repaved? I mean, I imagine Anderson might be different from a... Yeah, it does, de it does depend. Um, if I had my pavement condition index um, information in my brain, I could probably tell you better, but heavier, more heavily traffic roads do get, uh, would need to be paved more frequently. There's different types of paving. There's just an overlay uh, that we can add that prolongs the life of a particular road. When certain roads get um, too degraded, then we have to basically completely reconstruct them, which is a much bigger, obviously much more expensive kind of, of project. So um, I don't have the, the number of years between pavings, but I'm happy to talk to our engineers and kind of get some more details on that. Um, but I can say that we've tried to do uh, the ceiling of the roads, so this would be overlay um, more frequently and with more um, trying to capture more of the, the roads around around town so they don't degrade further. And that's the that's the quicker, easier uh, piece. So that doesn't answer your question of how frequent, but yeah. I'll find out some I ask more for the context that from 
here and there, perhaps uh, certain facilities issues, uh, if the road is expected to need repaving at some predictable moment, then that might be an opportunity to, uh, you know, work mm -hmm. in some appropriate yeah, one of the one of the things we've really tried to do in the past few years is have communication before we get too far down the road. Kind of pun intended with the project, um, with the with the campus. I'm uh, sorry, with the, the the district, and we have that has actually proven really useful. I hope to the district as well as as us um, in making sure that we are coordinating and timing things as appropriately as possible. But then also there are other things that may come up that we weren't we didn't have on our radar screen or perhaps the district didn't have on theirs. Just by communicating, we're often able to um, you know, build build something in or figure out uh, an addition that needs to be added to um, our scope for the project actually a project actually starts. So I'm, I'm assuming that the communication is helpful for the district. But. Thank you. Sure. So, I have a question that's kind of road related, but not exactly. Um, well, um, you know, the we have the bus routes, and um, I've noticed especially now when we're getting some days where we have this intense rain. Um, does the city work with um, Unitrans to, um, I don't even know if they work with the district, but if they work with city and Unitrans to address areas where there's a lot of students or members of the public that are waiting for public transportation and take into consideration that it might be a good idea to have a uh, shelter there, a little shelter space, so that people don't get drenched while they're waiting. I've just noticed that a lot lately for some reason, I guess because we've had such intense rain. So the short answer is yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'll speak for the city. Yes, the city works closely with Unitrans. I believe they work. I believe Unitrans works pretty closely with the district as well, um, trying to coordinate. Um, it, Unitrans has to provide citywide um, transit, and obviously, with there's a focus on UC Davis campus, but they do try to coordinate with the timing of um, school schedules and things like that. Uh, and if there is um, a need, interest, desire, or something for uh, some sort of amenity that's related to the transit, such as a shelter, we do have um, conversations and frequent meetings to talk through um, where we might need something, you know, where a, a, a shortfall has come up. So, yes, that mechanism um, or those lines of communication are open and in place. Um, yeah, very similar for us. We pass along concerns, shelters, bus routes, those sorts of things, and then we meet pretty intensely annually each spring where we're sharing our um, where students are living, how many students at each school, if there's any shifts in our bell schedules, uh, fine-tuning the routes a little bit with them. Um, and as Kelly said, their interest is to transit UC Davis students most, but they are also very good partners and stewards of community transit um, and have been very accommodating, building routes, shaping routes to uh, support our students, as many of them, especially our secondary students, use the bus to, to get to school. Thank you. Yeah, so just to, to follow up on that. So when you're looking at it, I, I would assume, for example, um, when projects come online, they're complete, that, that there's an analyzing of like, for example, Celeste and South Davis, right? There's not right by, you know, there's a number of students there, you know, Plaza 2555 coming on, hopefully for next school year, and then the work on Research Drive, where there's gonna be housing. Is that, when you look at that, do you have, you're able to identify a number of students and let them know when there's new bus routes or more frequent things like that? Exactly right, so and that's one where we've been hearing yeah. from in South Davis, yeah. where um, more students came than we expected, and, and many of them are low-income families who, um, have transportation challenge, and so we've been working with Unitrans and also other creative solutions to help those get those folks to school. Yeah, absolutely, and I really appreciate that, and thank you, Cecilia, for bringing it up. There's, you know, in dovetail into that, you have New Harmony as well, right? Where there's a number of students. When you look at the Drum and Albany intersection, there, there's a bus stop that's just a post in the ground, and that's it. And you oftentimes, I drive through there a lot, and you see students out there, and especially with the, the increase in housing. Specifically in South Davis over the past 18 months and in the future year, um, it's definitely important. So I appreciate you following that and keeping the pulse on it. Thank you. Don? 
Thank you. And I know Cecilia, your question was more about shelters, but the other thing too that Unitrans and the city have been coordinating on is the ADA compliance at the Unitrans bus stops. There was some work too that needed to be done and they're really working on addressing those issues as well, which is great. Um, Kelly, just remind me, when you were talking about H Street, is that the repairs to the bike tunnel or the paving of H? I'm just not remembering exactly what's gonna happen on H Street. Uh, I believe with that project it was tiered and there was both, um, there's the repairs to the tunnel and then there's additional paving um, that, that happens for the remainder of H Street because we did some paving on H Street a couple years ago now. We were in a little length here. Mm -hmm. Right, right. right. So it's the, it's the rest of it. Great, great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that and the in-depth uh, follow-up on that. Uh, 5D, school site safety update. Turn it over to Superintendent Best. Yeah, so we, we've had a, a quite a tumultuous year um, with regards to school safety. You know, started the year off with a litany of bomb threats. Um, and then in uh, October, November, we started to experience uh, vandalism, particularly focused at our elementary sites. And um, uh, many broken windows um, at multiple um, of our elementary sites. Um, one of our black teachers was targeted with uh, the N-word on the back of her classroom in Korematsu. And um, so as a result, we have uh, taken an unprecedented step for us as a district and installed, uh, done a camp, we've initiated a, a camera pilot, a surveillance pilot, at all eight of our elementary campuses, uh, with the uh, exception of Fairfield. And um, those cameras are turned on at night um, they're essentially standalone, battery-operated um, cameras that capture images when there's movement. And uh, part of the, the purpose of this pilot is to see if there is useful or meaningful information that can be gathered when these incidents happen to either help us identify what problem we're trying to solve. Are these students? Are these adults? Are these unhoused people? Are these residents move, you know, moving around through campus? Um, what, what is the, 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 the situation when these events happen? And um, ultimately to prevent and or pro, you know, prosecute potential perpetrators. And so um, we've only had one incident of vandalism since the cameras were installed right before winter break. We've actually had a couple all at Pioneer Elementary um, where we uh, have uh, observed a couple of ad adult individuals who are likely living on campus. Um, we've had several bathroom break-ins, the sheds, the sort of peripheral sheds for gardens and PTAs and those sorts of things continue to get broken into. So that information, of course, gets passed on to Davis Police Department, helps our staff to know what to do in the mornings as we um, clear the campus for students uh, to arrive. So we are gathering some information. Uh, it has not been uh, ultimately useful in identifying the individuals that are engaging in this behavior. Um, and we're intending to keep that pilot in place through the month of January and reassess where we are at that point, um, whether we need to extend, expand, uh, retract, et cetera. We'll make that decision as we get a little further in the month. Thank you, Matt. Any colleagues have questions for, for Matt on that? All right, not seeing any, you know, that's obviously, thank you for doing that. I know it's, it, you know, it's gotta be so frustrating. I mean, to, when you're looking at showing up to school each day and having things broken, people are, I mean, it just, it's, you know, it's the first thing that people see when they show up and it, it's not only, you know, a cost factor, but I think it, it, it permeates into the sense of safety for people when they bring their kids to school and especially when it's targeted, targeted to elementary schools, um, not just the parents, but, you know, a first grader, second grader, third grader coming to school and seeing that and wondering what's happening and why, you know, I mean, I think it, it does go down and, and affect students in, in such a different way. I think that sometimes you get lost in the conversation. Um, so I think it's, it's such an important piece and role that you do. I know for years, my kids are at Montgomery and I, we had a ton of graffiti that was going on. And kids would show up and there were unbelievably horrible things written on the wall and it would take a little bit to get somebody there, right? And then the kids would have this conversation about why it's happening. And you mean, so it, 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 it's, it's more than just the, the, I'm not implying this what you're saying, I'm just thanking you for doing this because I think it's, it's larger than just graffiti and a broken window. Yeah, and one of the things that I will add that sort of has come about as a result of this is um, 
we now have a very uh, stringent process whenever there's vandalism, and, and frequently vandalism is connected with a hate crime, uh, like happened at uh, Korematsu. And uh, so making sure that we are checking the whole campus, uh, notifying staff and community when these things happen, circling back with staff and community and students who might be impacted by this, so they know that like we're paying attention, something's happened, here's what's going to happen as a result, making sure that all those steps are followed, um, because like, like you mentioned, uh, I think sometimes in the past in our district that's been handled haphazardly, uh, depending on who responds, what time of day, uh, what happened, we want that to be more uniform, predictable, because I think the, the core message that you're getting at is that there's more fear when these things happen uh, from staff, from students, from parents. Uh, Pre-pandemic, you know, I, I think I, I, there were so many times where that, that vandalism would happen and everybody would just say, darn kids, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and that is not what people are saying now, right? They're worried that this is targeted uh, vandalism to terrorize uh, the school and school community. Um, so I think there's just a, a heightened level of angst and fear uh, all the way through our organization, and we need to respond to that in as effective way. I think part of our strategy is make safety improvements um, in thoughtful and deliberate ways, and also be very clear and transparent about what you're doing when these things happen and how you're responding. Yeah, absolutely. And sadly, it's happening far too often. And um, you know, we heard uh, we heard last night in our council meeting examples from. At, at schools, recent examples and examples in the past of, of exactly what you're describing. So I think it's, it's, it's here and uh, important that we address it the way you are. So thank you, you and, and my colleagues on the on the board for, for taking this on. Um, any other questions for 5D or comments? All right, with that, I'm going to open up public comment for um, any of the discussion items A, B, C, or D. If there's anybody here who would like to make a public comment, please feel free to come forward. Don't run too fast. All good. We won't bite. All right. Seeing none, we'll move to agenda item number six: announcements, comments. Um, I will turn to our respective staff first, and then back to uh, my colleagues up here. Nothing here. All right. Thank you to any of my colleagues. Have announcements or comments? Yes, I, I attended the. the I, I was mentioned yesterday. I, was, I attended the first part of the uh, city council meeting. I attended the MLK uh, celebration on Monday that the, the city sponsors and just wanted to give my uh, gratitude for uh, a very nice uh, uh, you know, show that, that, uh, that was put on and um, I, I appreciate it. Yeah, thank um, you. Um, um, I just want to mention something while we're all here. Um, one of the areas of real interest for me is mental health uh, services, including for students, and I was so appreciative of Kara Mesmore coming to our last meeting and describing for us the work she's doing at DJUSD. So I wanted to be sure that you and the school community are all aware that right now the county, Yolo County, is going through what it calls the Community Engagement Work Group Process, which is part of the Mental Health Services Act. It's a requirement that they conduct these community engagement um, meetings to hear from the community about what mental health needs are in the county. And as I'm sure you all know, there's some potentially very, very significant changes coming down the road to the Mental Health Services Act in terms of how the money can be spent. There's some risk of the K-12 partnership money drying up. So I just wanted to make sure you all knew about those work groups and perhaps someone in the school community wanted to be there to you know, be a voice in that process because this is really the chance to let the county know what the needs are. Yeah, thank you. We, we've really uh, established a really great partnership with County Mental Health, and uh, through that, this MHP, and I can never remember what the MHP, yeah, something, M -M -M. acronyms with M's and H's and S's and A's. Um, and um, so we've been providing feedback along the way about how we think things should continue uh, and expand, and we've been making, quite frankly, decisions together about how to shift that grant funds as the real world situation evolves. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. We'll definitely make sure to make sure our voices are heard there. Thank you. Any other comments, Melvin? I just want to say I um, I saw the Martin Luther King uh, event too. I saw it. It was uh, uh, Davis Media Access showed it, and um, it was just 
giving the hate crimes that have happened uh, recently that are very unsettling, it was just nice to see a program that really emulated love and acceptance and diversity. And it just made me so proud. I thought, boy, we have a lot of talented students in our district. Um, the songs, the speeches, the poetry, it was just beautiful. And it's just nice to see an event like that. Um, and I'm hoping that we see more, you know, not just on special days like MLK Day, but just to, to share with the community that there are a lot of students and people in general in the public that um, show love and acceptance and not division and hate. So it was just, it was very nice. It was a great program. And I really want to thank the city. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Yeah. Not, thank, not me for on purpose. I'll be sure thank to pass you. it off this time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, great. Uh, we will now move to agenda um, item number seven, future meeting. Looks like we're scheduled for March 20th and then May 15th. Um, so let's you know get those on your calendar. Any um, topics or agenda items, feel free obviously to send them over to respective staff, work on them beforehand. If there are new, new ideas that come up or ways, we, we tend oftentimes to have some very similar items and updates, which are extremely important. If there's any other pieces that come up that um, in, in your in your in your daily lives and work that you do, where there's collaboration or some proactive things that we can work on together that aren't reactionary, then we'd love to. And about, that's not in a bad way, but um, just thinking outside the box of ways that we can continue to, to foster the relationship and make it stronger as we continue to move forward. So um, mark those dates on your calendar. Look forward to, to seeing you all in March. And with that, we'll be adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.